Lord, it is so holy what you have done in Todd, what you are doing in Todd, and what you are doing through him. Lord, I thank you for the gift that he is at this church today. It is, this is truly a gift. And I pray that we would not miss it. Lord, I, I pray that we would see beyond Todd White to see, oh my, Jesus. Jesus has brought a gift here today to impart something from heaven so that we will never be the same again. And so, Lord, I just pray, let, let Todd be hidden behind your cross today so that we would miss nothing of what the grace of God wants to do here in us. We love you, Lord. Bless this man. Bless his family. Bless everything about this man, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh. Round two. thank you so much for just letting me a chance to pour out my heart God to bring you glory Holy Spirit you would have your way you would have dominion and God you would just have your way Father we just love you and glorify you Jesus thank you for another day look like you <laughs> you know mercy woke you up this morning God gave you one more day another chance another day to manifest him and not you <laughs> people always tell me everywhere I go boy this is such a cost man. it's cost you I just don't I don't buy into that man I think it's a lie People say, oh, this will really cost you. And they see my life, and you know, I, I shared our testimony in the first service, part of it, and just how my wife and I now were married, weren't for nine years, destroyed stuff, drug addiction and all that. Now we're married, we're together for, <clears throat> married going on, going on nine years. The 18 years in October, married for nine of them. My daughter, our oldest daughter, is 16. Our youngest daughters, our younger daughters are seven and two. And I travel the world and I preach the gospel. People say, boy, this will cost you. How do you do it? How do you, I had people ask me this week, how do you, how do you do family? I mean, how do you do it? And I said, grace. And I said, if, if my wife wouldn't, know who she is and wouldn't have the grace of God on her life. She could never do what she does because doing what she does is hard. But with the grace of God, it's not hard. It's not a cost to sacrifice your husband to a call of the gospel because you've given your life to the same call of the gospel in the home. To raise up kids in the right way of the Lord, to raise up kids in the right way of Jesus. And I travel and I'm home for maybe three days a week. And I'm not a part-time dad, I'm a full-time dad. God's a full-time dad. So if my father can do it, I can do it. And what God's called you to, he'll always give you grace in order to do it. Grace isn't a license to just do whatever you want. Grace is the, the reality of the fuel that fills your engine, that enables your motor to run. Grace is God's willingness to forgive you, God's willingness to empower you, God's willingness to say yes to you when you are yet twisted and whacked. Jesus, Jesus came into the world and grace and truth came through Jesus. And he came bringing the truth. He came walking out the truth. Pilots like, 
what is truth? Jesus was truth personified. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Truth calls us to a higher standard. Truth calls us to something that's not naturally possible, but supernaturally easy. The gospel isn't something that's just words on a page that is, wow, that's a good book. Well, yeah, have you read the good book? I've heard so many people talk about it by the good book. And there's people with their Bible pages falling out. I think that's amazing. But you can read your Bible all the days of your life and never, ever enter into relationship with the Holy Spirit that opens up and illuminates and makes the Word alive. And the Word has to be alive for you or else it's just a book or else we're just going about through the motions. We're just doing Christianity. And doing Christianity isn't what Jesus asked you to do. Doing Christianity would be a form of of trying to accomplish something by doing to get to something that you can only enter into by being to become. You have to become something. Jesus paid a price for us more than just for us to get to heaven. If you paid a price just for us to get to heaven, you'd have prayed a prayer and disappeared. You'd have just said, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Bang, you'd have disappeared. You'd have prayed a prayer. People around you would have been like, what happened? They prayed that prayer, don't do it. (laughs) And so without seeing the reality of why you're on the earth, and without seeing the reality of why God left you here, you will think that Jesus paid a price to rescue you from the big bad world so that you can get to the big old sweet by and by, and you will picture the Bible and look at the Bible through an eschatology eye and an end times revelation, God, get me out of here, it's really bad, my parents are mean, my kids are going astray, my life is a wreck, it's terrible, my job is this, my friends are this, man, everybody's against me, God, get me out of here, to heaven with me and to hell with everybody else. And if that's the way you picture the gospel, we're in trouble. Because Jesus didn't say, pray a prayer so you can escape. As a matter of fact, he prayed for the disciples. And he said, God, I don't pray in John 17, which is the Lord's prayer. He said, God, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Wow. Jesus said things like, as, I sa- as the Father sent me, so I send you. Same power, same authority, same everything. Well, yeah, but that was the disciples. He didn't change the program. The disciples accomplished what they accomplished with the power of the Holy Spirit. I said earlier in first service, how can we, how can we have the same things that the disciples had and they had in the book of Acts that Jesus had if we honor a book more than the Holy Spirit that they did have? And I'm not saying to not read your Bible, but without Holy Spirit, it's closed, it's sealed, it's... It's a shut up book. It's not supposed to be read with your mind. It's supposed to be illuminated by Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him fills those pages and those pages want to fill you. And we're not supposed to just memorize the Word or quote the Word. We're supposed to become the Word. Jesus was the Word made flesh and we're supposed to become the very Word we say we know so the people around us can say, that guy knows God. That woman knows God. Not that woman goes to church. Church isn't a bad deal. It's a good deal. We're not supposed to forsake the assembling together of the saints. It's not like we're not supposed to go. We are. But if we think it's all about going, we'll forget the being. We're supposed to be the church. We are. Jesus said things like, I'm the light of the world. And in him was the light of men. All men. And then it says, in Matthew, it says, you're the light of the world. It's not this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That sounds good, but that's not scripture. It's not this little light of mine. What does it mean, what is a little light compared to you being the light of the world? Well, I know that's what he says, but that's not what he means. Stop it. God says that when I go into a place, I illuminate it. God says that when I go into darkness, I illuminate it. Darkness isn't the issue. Darkness is never the issue. It's not. No one ever went into a room and said, oh my gosh, who turned up the darkness? (laughs) However, in a dark room, it's who turned off the light or who turned down the light. 
Darkness isn't the issue. We've, we've, we've adopted a fear mentality in the body of Christ in a in, 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 in hole, in a big hole, and we're kind of freaked out when it gets dark. We can actually sense the darkness. We can feel the darkness. People are like, oh my gosh, do you feel how dark it is? I'm like, no, I don't. Did anybody see the Father of Lights movie? Okay. You should. It's really awesome. We went into Muslim community, into Muslim, has anybody ever been to Israel? Okay. So in Israel, there's a place in, in Jerusalem called the Dome of the Rock. And the Dome of the Rock is a Muslim shrine. When you look at Jerusalem, you see this gold dome in there. That's the Dome of the Rock. That's where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. That's Mount Moriah. That's where the temple used to be on the Temple Mount. That's where the Holy of Holies rested right above that place or right on that very spot. And the Muslims have put a cap upon that thing because that was the promise where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac and God told Abraham that through your seed, which wasn't just Isaac, but was Jesus, was faith in what Jesus did, I will bless all the nations. Awesome, right? So the Muslims have capped that because they, they believe that Abraham was going to sacrifice Ishmael. Abraham, Ishmael. If you look at the Muslim faith and the Christian faith, when you look at the line on down the line, the Muslim faith comes through Ishmael. And Ishmael was kicked out of the house and lost his father. And the Muslims are looking for a father. Oh, it's so huge. It's so amazing. They're not our enemy. People aren't your war. People aren't your enemy. It's not dark. It's not a problem. That's not an issue. We fear death. We fear people. We're afraid of people. We're afraid of what they might do to us. But if you see who Christ has created you to be, you won't be afraid of anybody. You will live your life as a bright and shining lamp, and you will not have a basket on your head. And people at your workplace will know you worship Jesus, not because of your confession, but because of your work ethic, because of your life lived, because you're doing your job as unto the Lord and not for people. But because your response is different, when crisis hit, you're in Christ. When dilemma and drama hits, you're not part of it. When joking happens about people at work, you don't take part in it. Hey, come on, man, back off. No, I won't back off. Because people see you joking about somebody else and you claim to be a Christian, they do too. What's the difference between the world and you? It's time that we take the spirit of ugly off the bride. Jesus was beautiful, man, and he called us to walk like him. Are you guys okay? You guys had amazing worship service. Don't get bummed out right now. I'm going to bring it, dude. I promise you. Because God loves you. He loves you so much. You know, the gospel set me so free from me that I'm free from you and your opinion. <laughs> I'm serious, even when I come up on stage, people don't know I'm coming, they're like, <clears throat> what's going on here? <laughs> I come to churches a lot of times, I don't even sit in the front, I sit in the back. And people are praying for me to get saved. And you should. <laughs> and I come up front and get the mic, they're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and at first they're like, it's awesome, man. It's like a horse at a new gate. <laughs> but I'm in love with Jesus, man. The gospel sets you free from you. And if you're free from you, you're free from others. That's real freedom, man. Me being free to your opinion so that I will walk out the truth in love. And I won't hold back the truth, but I won't speak it to hurt you. I will speak it to put a fire in your heart so that you don't sit and act the same old, same old. But you come up to the reality of the high calling of Christ. So that you walk worthy of the calling. So that you can walk in such a way that people around you would be highly affected by your walk, not just your talk. They'd be so blown away by the way you act that they're like, oh my gosh, what is this? Muslims aren't our problem. People aren't our problem. Witches aren't our problem. I love witches. Dude, I just want to hug them. 
I'm really not freaked out by them. Oh my gosh, they're a witch. So what? So many people are so freaked out by that stuff. I'm not kidding. We've got a fear thing because we don't understand who we are. Is it not true that Jesus has given us not the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind? So if He has given us that, why are we so afraid? If He says that we're not supposed to be ashamed of the gospel, then we better understand why we're not supposed to be ashamed. I mean, when I, when I went to Teen Challenge, because in the beginning of my life I started at Teen Challenge, when I went in there, God told me, He was stamping a scripture on my forehead. He said, it's Matthew 6, You're going to live by this all the days of your life. And I thought, well, that's great. What is it? I looked at it, and it says, seek first. Seek first. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is a great place to start. Why? Because it says to seek first. So I looked at it, and I looked at it, and and it's the answer to worry. And I looked at, like, life and all the stuff that we go through, and worry is, like, priority in a lot of people's lives. Come on. Worry is a problem. Anxiety is not supposed to be our stuff. I get it. Well, you don't understand. I have chemical imbalance, and I've been labeled, and I have this, and I have that. I get it. I did too. I had it all. And then Jesus said, not guilty. That not guilty. See, look, I I was horrible. Drug addicts, as twisted as twisted could possibly be. I mean, twisted. Grew up in the Masonic homes, raised, practiced witchcraft. uh, uh, Everything, man. All that stuff. Everything. I had issues and issues. I had a lifetime subscription to issues and Jesus canceled it. I had all that stuff, all of it, all of it, all of it, all of it. Uh, Me, of all people, have so much stuff that I could go back and revisit that would whisper my name and tell me you're not forgiven. Well, yeah, but what about this? What about that? It's Satan's number one pound. He pounds us and says, yeah, well, remember when? No, you shouldn't have done that. You know, you shouldn't have. You shouldn't have raised your voice like that. You shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have stole that. You shouldn't have done this. And, and I have all that stuff. And then you have other people that are like, I never stole. I, didn't, I wasn't a thief. I've been a good person my whole life. I, I, haven't, I haven't done this and I haven't done that. I didn't, like, I wasn't a drug addict. People look at me and they're like, wow, I wasn't as bad as you, bro. I get it. And I'm not being, and it's true in the worldly sense and in reason and in logic, it looks like you're better off than where I was. But here's the hard part. The hard part is logically trying to compute the gospel that can only be discerned supernaturally. That's the hard part. I talked to so many people who are like, well, you know what? And, and it was such a trouble in my life because in the beginning, and, and still now even, people say to me, well, I wasn't a drug addict, bro, and I don't have a testimony like you. But, I, you know, when I gave my life to Jesus, I didn't have all that my life and then there's something different about your life what is the deal why you know I know why you love so much because you've been forgiven so much and, and in the beginning of my life it troubled my heart so much and I needed God to help me because people thought they always told me that they said Todd the reason why you love so much is because how much you've been forgiven I mean guys right now I'm going on nine years as a Christian I was an atheist I was a drug addict I hated Christians I hated everybody but me and I had an encounter in a drug deal about eight and a half years ago where I got shot at had got, Jesus came, spoke to me, and changed my life. I'm married, I have my wife. I travel and preach the gospel. I didn't go to school, but I had an encounter with Him. And in the beginning, people were like, I, I remember going places and, and ministering, or, or just going places and hanging out. People saying, oh, you're, you must be new. I, when I, I was on fire, when I first... God saved, you're just fresh, wait till life comes. And I would be like, what is, what are you talking about, man? Are you guys hearing me? It's not okay to let life speak louder than the cross. It's not okay to allow life to speak louder than the blood of Jesus, man. Come on, what are we thinking? It doesn't change, it's forever the same. The blood is always coagulate, it never coagulates. Always coursing on the mercy seat saying, mercy. Mercy, 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 not guilty, mercy, 
forgiven, mercy, not guilty, mercy, always. But we listen to the stranger's voice loud and clear instead of believing the truth that sets us free. I remember going into hospitals and praying for people and a nurse. I, I gave the testimony the other day. I was at the hospital and a nurse came up to me and we had prayed for somebody to, to be healed in the hospital. And I was like a few months old in God and I was starting to see miracles and awesome stuff that a lot of people don't believe in. It was too late. You're not talking me out of it. Jesus is amazing. <laughs> Done with all that. Jesus, we will pray for the sick today, okay? All right? I want this man's lungs right here that's sitting beside you to be healed. This man right here, his lungs and his heart. I want your chest and everything on your insides to be healed. I want lungs to be made whole today. I want physically, I want bodies to be healed. I want arthritis to leave you. I want you to not be crippled. I want your body to be straightened out. I want Jesus to touch your body. I want you to be out of the chair. I want that. God wants that. I want that. I've seen too much. You ain't talking me out of this, man. Jesus is amazing. I'm no miracle man, but he is. And he loves us. I'm in the hospital praying for this lady. Come out of the room and I'm I'm excited. I'm I'm still excited. She's like, whoa. She goes, I heard you praying. She goes, I used to be that way. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been Christian for about 30 years or so. And I said, what's, what's going on? She says, well, you know, you'll see. I said, what are you talking about? She says, you'll see. I said, no, I won't see. I was lost. Now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. What do you mean I will see? I see. She says, well, you, you haven't gone through life. And she's a nurse. She's allowed her heart to get kind of calloused because of the stuff that she sees. And a lot of the stuff she sees, she blames God for. And I said, honey, I, said, I just didn't know any better. I still don't know any better. I just looked at her and I said, did Jesus change? She goes, well, no, you don't understand. I've been a Christian for a long time. And I went, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus never changed. He never told you to change. He told you to just give him your life. Well, I did. You don't understand who you're talking to. Just that kind of stuff. I'm like, I love you. And I'm in tears and she's just, wham, hammered. And I'm blessed because she did. Because when I'm persecuted for believing the truth of the gospel, persecuted for righteousness sake, I am blessed beyond belief. I mean, when a Muslim comes up and doesn't believe what I believe. I was in a store yesterday, downtown in your town, 80,000 happy people. Because your team won. I went into a store. It's a Muslim-owned store. And I said, hey, how you doing? We're walking through. He goes, I'm doing good. And I, I was looking for something for my hair. Just something to keep all this in. It's like one of those just linen shop, Muslim-owned shop. And he was showing me. And I said, man, that won't fit. I looked at him and I said, man. I said, I just want to tell you I love you, man. He goes, well, thank you very much. He goes, who are you? I said, I'm a Christian. And I know he's a Muslim. His wife has a burqa on. And I said to him, I said, hey. He goes, Muslims and Christians. He goes, you know, we believe the same thing. I said, not really. I said, because when I say Jesus, you say prophet. But when I say Jesus, I know Messiah. And I looked at him and I said, can I pray for you? He goes, if you would like. I said, oh. (laughs) And I wasn't being mean. I just put my hands on his back and chest and prayed for God to bless him, bless his shop, to increase the reality of who Jesus is in his life, that he would bless him beyond belief. And he was like, thank you. I said, man, and I blessed him and I prayed for his back and two discs in his back and thank God for his left knee and thank God for him. Jesus, thank you. And I took my hand off and he had, t- he had watery eyes. He looked at me and he goes, thank you. I said, man, I just love you, man. He goes, me too. I said, I said, can I, can I pray for this other person that's over here? I'm going to walk over. He goes, no, 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 sir. We're doing business right now. You, you, you must leave. And by this time, he was shaken because the presence of God is real. And he made the mistake of letting me pray. 
And I'm not boasting to be anybody. I'm telling you that Christ lives in me. Christ lives in you. The presence of Christ in you is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But the, but the Christ in you, the hope of glory, being made manifest is that hope being revealed when you release the reality of Christ in you, hope of glory, into every situation, into every shop, into every hospital, into every restaurant, into every place you go, every street corner, everywhere. You have something to give the world if you would just not make it all about you. Jesus didn't say to worship him in a church service alone. He said those that worship God in John 4 must worship him in spirit and truth. So what does it mean to worship him in spirit and truth? That means that without Holy Spirit communicating with your spirit, it's impossible to worship God. And without the truth, you might worship him just in spirit. But you need the truth of God's word so that it can illuminate what's dimly lit and make it very bright so that you start to think with the mind of Christ that God has given you. Listen, in days past, they said his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways are higher than our ways, and in the Old Testament, that's the truth. But in the New Testament, there is a change. Something happens. God says, don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can approve or you can prove the will of God everywhere you go. And he says that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. But we have, and they didn't have this in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, he gave us his mind. And we think, whoa, 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 that's blasphemy. No, 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 it's because we don't read our Bible that we think it's blasphemy. But our Bible says that we have been given the mind of Christ. In Hebrews 4, 12, it says that the Word of God is sharp, it's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide and separate the soul from the spirit, the joint from the marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So God's Word first comes to separate our soul from our spirit. And the Holy Spirit communicates with our spirit, and our soul isn't what just is, we say we're winning souls, and sometimes we've confused it in our thoughts, and we think that our soul is this, and our soul is that, but the, the, the Bible's very clear, and it talks about man being three parts. You have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. It says, may the God of peace sanctify you completely, spirit, soul, and body. It's in Thessalonians, or the Veggie Tales says it, Thessalonians. I have kids, so... The Thelunium. It's true. So He wants to sanctify a spirit. He wants our spirit to be born again. He wants our bodies to be healed. He wants our souls to be fixed because your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. And God wants us to be saved in our soul. Peter talks about it. It says the salvation of our soul, which is the finishing of our faith. It's in your Bible. It's all over it. And it talks about it in Peter, and it says, gird up the loins of your mind. Right after it talks about the salvation of the soul. So God wants our souls to be fixed. Our soul is our thinking, our mind, our will and emotions. And God wants us to be renewed in the spirit of our mind or be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we don't think the way that we did, but we start to think with His mind. We're supposed to have our minds seated with Christ. We are supposed to be, Ephesians 2, 6, seated with Christ in heavenly places. Colossians says that we're supposed to have our mind fixed on things above. Therefore, we don't live towards heaven, we live from it. We don't live towards victory, we live from victory. This is the gospel, I'm not like just giving you my opinion. I am preaching the word and it will come together in such a way, so beautiful and it just knits together and he takes it like a puzzle, he makes it all fit and bang, it becomes revelation. I'm serious to where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't get this out of my head. And you start to think different. It's true. So people have told me, Todd, you're, you know, you, you just knew, you're just this, or you're just that, or, or you love so much because of how much you've been, you know, you've just been forgiven of so much. Dude, you were such a train wreck, and now you're like, that's why, and I have 
trouble with that because I can't understand it because what they're saying to me is the reason why I love my wife just called me this morning or last night we just talked on the phone she had a, they had a family reunion yesterday and, and one of her brothers is really struggling and he's just been struggling I've always been there for him and, and they were talking about church stuff and her brother's just kind of you know he, he believes but he's like you know and it was so cool and, and Jackie's mom is my wife's mom's talking to him and he's like well he goes yeah it ain't just about going to, and I, I pour into this guy I love him man he's like my brother-in-law I just love him I, I die for him I love him and he used to hate me in my face it doesn't matter because I'm not here for people to like me Love doesn't say, I love you. Do you love me? Love doesn't say, I love you, man. Love doesn't say, hey, man, I love you, man. Love doesn't look for you to say, I love you back. Love just says, I love you, man. Period. That's love right there. I promise. That's God's love. God says, I love you. He doesn't say, come on, say it so I can feel better about me. We grow up that way. We grow up with the, I love you. Do you love me? Come on, say it. Why? Because I won't feel good about saying it to you because I only really said it for me. It's true. God doesn't say, I love you. Tell me back or I'm not saying it again. God doesn't even say, let me do these things for you. And if you don't thank me, I won't do them again. Yet we live that way our whole life. And we only do things to be appreciated by people. And if they don't appreciate us, we don't do it again. We say, see if I do that again. They don't even appreciate me. Because we don't live out of the reality of why we're created. God created us in His image. He appreciates us. He put us here. Jesus didn't just open a door. He died for you. He died for you. He gave us life. If you would see your value, man, you'd want this. You would see who God says you are. You would want this. It wouldn't be a question. It wouldn't be up for grabs. It wouldn't be, well, I'm glad you found your path. It's not a path. Jesus isn't the way to heaven. People preach that all the time. Hey, brother, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to heaven except by him. But that's not what your Bible says. And even though heaven's the end point, if you make that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, no one comes to heaven except by, ye, by him, then what you do is you pray a prayer to escape this world, to get to heaven, and to hell with everybody else. But he didn't say that. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, the Father. We need relationship with the Father. Not just get to heaven. Heaven is the destination, but if you don't see it this way, if your perspective, Matthew 6, 22, the eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eye is single, your whole body's full of light. I mean, I'm sorry. I feel like I need to say I'm sorry. There are people here, I'm sorry for what you've seen church-wise. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. But don't let that stop you from a relationship with God, from your Father. And don't sit there and say, well, I don't need to be a part of the church either because I got my own thing. That's demonic. We're not supposed to go to church, to church, to church to try to find people that love us. We're supposed to understand who we are, our identity in Christ, become love, and plug in. Well, I don't need the church. I got my own thing. I hear that all the time. It's totally from hell. It separates God's girl. Churches are separated because we got our own thing. They got their thing, we got our thing. No, we don't want to be part of that thing because we got our own thing. That's the devil too. Here's another demonic saying. Well, you know you can love them, but you don't have to like them. What is that? It's normal. It's normal. Well, you know, you got to love them because it's a commandment. You don't have to like them. You think God's like that? See, because when you love somebody and don't like them, you represent God. So now they think that's how your father is. They think God loves me, but he doesn't like me. God's just waiting till I mess up to whack me one, and that's not him. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He so loved us that he gave his son. So that whoever would believe it in him wouldn't perish. Whoever 
would believe that what Jesus did is enough, wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. And Jesus said this about eternal life in John 17. He said, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God. Whew, that's Jesus' definition of eternal life, that they might know him. Imagine that. Imagine if eternal life wasn't just about escape. Eternal life isn't about escape. God didn't come here to get you born again so that you would pray for Jesus to get you out of here. He came here to set you free from you so that you could bring Jesus here now. Christianity now. So that you could destroy the works of the devil now and one day get to heaven. After you've thumped hell for a living. Think I'm crazy. I am. I'm not out of my mind. I'm just out of yours. God called us to be fire. He called us to be a burning and shining lamp. He called us to burn. He called us to light fires everywhere we go. He called us to be light in darkness. So when it's dark, light is there because you're there. I'm not putting on a show. I live this, man. Anybody that knows me knows that this is full on. You know what Johnny said yesterday? Jackie and they were talking. He said, well, I know it ain't about just going to church, man, and then living like hell throughout the week. He heard that from me. He goes, I'll tell you right now, and I'm not saying this, so that you look at me and say, wow, Johnny, this guy that's outside that doesn't really talk to me about this kind of stuff. Like, he listens, and I pour into him. He goes, man, uh, Todd reminds me of Jesus. That's what he does. That's all he said, and he walked away, and my wife just sat there and bawled. Because I'm pouring into our family, because all of them, none of them are getting out of this, man. None of them. And almost every one of my family members on both sides are now Christians. And it has not come the easy way. They have hammered me and persecuted me. And I've loved them. See, I believe that in the reality of Christianity, we're trees of righteousness. That's what God says. It's Isaiah 61. We're trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. That's the Bible. You will not be able to get out of what I'm preaching today. I promise you. Because it's solid. It's all set up by God. It's not something where I studied to... To teach you. The Bible doesn't say study to teach. It says study to show. And I'm not against teaching or preparing sermons. I just don't know that way. I know to spend time in the secret place. And then when I'm in the open, he pours out. That's all. I don't know another way. That's it. I know my father. The Bible's the first book that I can understand, man. I could never read a book my whole life. I had trouble. I couldn't read. 34 years, I never put my face in a book because I couldn't focus. I couldn't concentrate. My mind would be three words in and drift to wherever, and I never, ever remembered anything I read, so why read? And that's how I live my life. The Bible is the first book that I can get. The first one. I tell people, I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I'm like, it's the only one you really didn't understand. Because the Bible is so amazing. It's a lie. It's a lie. And it blooms and blossoms and... and it judges the thoughts and intents of your heart that aren't right. And it, it gets it out of there. And it rams the truth into your brain, renews your mind. It's awesome. It's the sword. It's the word. It's sharper. It goes. You're like, oh. And you start to act out the reality of the truth of the gospel. You start to see people for their created value. You start to see people, why they're on the earth and why they're created. And there's no excuses that you have to have anymore. Jesus says, you know what, disciples? He says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And then he says something like this. This is crazy. If you forgive the sins of any, I'll forgive them. But if you retain them, they're retained. Whew, that's heavy, man. Heavy. What does that mean? That means that if you can't forgive, they will not believe that God forgives. And if you want to hold judgment and sin against people, then they'll believe that that's how your father is. So if you want to say that you have to love people, but you don't have to like them, then that's how they view God as. We represent Jesus Christ. If the world can't see Christ in you, they don't want what you have. You can't sell it to them. You can't headlock it into them. There is nothing that you can do. They have to see it. Not like talking.
Thomas, but we are called to represent the gospel. Christ in us, the hope of glory, flowing out of us, touching the world around us, despite what they think about us. Despite what anybody thinks about us. Jesus is amazing. Don't think that you dream this up yourself. You didn't choose him. He chose you. People say, well, I found God. You're wrong. Read your Bible and you'll find out that you were wrong. He found you. Your Bible says that nobody comes to God unless, nobody comes to Him unless He draws them. So people that say, well, I found God. He'll let you think that for a while, but once you get in the Word and the Word starts to read you, it will discern that thought, rip that out. And you'll know that your Father said yes to you way before you said yes to Him. And when you find out that He said yes to you way before you said yes to Him, you'll realize that when you were an enemy and when you were at war against God, He said, I want that one. And you'll be like, oh my God, that's great love. And you'll be wrecked. That way when you see somebody that's treating you wrong, you'll first love them before they love you. It's the truth, man. It's fun. The gospel means good news. Are you getting it at all? Kind of. Look it out there and you're like, twitching a little. It's all right. It's good. I am encouraged. Because I get to ride on planes with people today. I do. I have the best time. I do. I sit beside people. I get upgraded my first, my second leg today. I'm going to sit with a breed of people. And I'm going to go up there and sit in first class. And they'll see me come and they'll think, musician. And I'm like, Jesus! You give a musician. Holy, holy Jesus, you're amazing, God. Take this life you gave to me and glorify you, Jesus. You're amazing, God. And you made me just like you. Cause I'm a son and I am just like my father. <laughs> Cause I'm your son. I am just like my father Jesus receive glory from my life may you be honored in everything I say and do Jesus show my appreciation for everything I do from you I'm excited yeah, about what you are doing I don't believe this is revival because you're not dead I believe the church is waking up again this is reawakening reawakening God send it to Madison it's bringing back the unity God the church is coming together as one yeah. Holy Spirit, have your way, have your way in the hand. Show us who we're created to be. Just like you, Jesus. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. He's nice. Oh man. You should be excited, man. Not about how your day has gone, but because he came to give you a new life. Regardless of what you're going through, you know, your trials and stuff, all that stuff, it's created not by God. The trials come from the enemy. Jesus, I get this picture of God when I face hard stuff, when hard stuff comes my way. I get this picture of God sitting on the throne looking at me and saying, what are you going to do? <laughs> I do. So many people think that God sends it. I just don't believe I found that in Scripture at all. I believe the devil sends it. I believe the trials don't come from God. I believe they come from hell. Do you think the fire came from God when Nebuchadnezzar threw the boys in there? No way. Nebuchadnezzar brought the fire. What is Nebuchadnezzar a representative of? The fire was real. What did the boys come out of that furnace like? <laughs> come on, the fire's still real. It's still real. Trials produce perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope doesn't disappoint. But the trial, we think, oh, no! What about, come on, bring it. Man, if I can teach people to manifest Jesus in the fire, wow, when it's really nice, it'll be easy. Be like, what's wrong? Something's got to happen here. Warriors, man. Warriors. That is why Johnny, my wife's brother, says that stuff. Stuff comes my way and he doesn't see a change. He doesn't see a shift. He doesn't see a turn. He sees steadfast Jesus. Are you getting it? A little? Like, I don't know what's going on right now. But it's pretty cool, I think. <laughs> uh, you know what? The other day I, I shared about like traffic and stuff and how like I respond in traffic and, and when we were in traffic, stuck, open the window. Hey! And shared the Je share Jesus with people driving beside me. They're stuck in traffic. <laughs> I do. I shared a testimony about a guy that was sitting there arguing with his girlfriend, freaking out, man. Me and Dan are in a truck. We're in traffic, we're stuck, we have a six hour drive and it's longer because we're in more, this traffic that's tied up. I opened the window, I said, hey! He goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say nothing. <laughs> Don't be freaked out by people's responses. Give them Jesus. And I said to him, hey man. I said, how you doing? And I started talking to him and he's like, what? And I said, man. And I started talking about God, and I said, dude, I said, you have a pain in the right side of your neck. He goes, what? And I said, yes, right here. I said, God loves you, man. And I started to share the gospel with him. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, man, I just, I'm going to pray for you right now. Jesus is going to heal your neck right now. Dan's driving. He's like, it's awesome. He's having fun. We're such a, people are such an inconvenience, and we're such an inconvenience people because we're in a hurry to get nowhere. We're going about our grocery trip, whatever. We got to get some, we got to program, we got to do this, we got to get this done. And everybody, it's just all about us. Jesus is concerned about people, man. They're not an inconvenience, they're an opportunity. So this guy gets healed. He goes, What? I said, Dude, he loves you, man. There's no way out of it. And he can't go anywhere, so I get to share the gospel with him because his window and stuff. And his girlfriend's like, and it wasn't like I did that because they were fighting. I did that because he was beside me. And it's happened so many times. Just like that, man. Don't lose your perspective of why Jesus saved you. He paid a price to set you free from you. The gospel doesn't say, deny the devil, pick up your cross and follow him. It says, deny your self. And some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy still. It's all right. I am. I'm crazy in love with my Jesus, man. And he's in love with you. Okay. Let me seal this up. Gosh, I didn't even take you into this book. I have it here, just so you know. I shared a lot of scripture. Did you get it? Did you get it? 
In the Bible, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what it says. So when I look at my life and I heard all these people tell me about how, how you know, how, how the reason why I love much is because how much I've been forgiven. Because you get that out of, out of Luke 7 with the lady that came to wash Jesus' feet with the alabaster, right? She broke it. And in there it says, Jesus, like this lady busted in. In one account, she's behind him washing his feet. Another one, she's in front of him, wash, she's, she's washing his hair. But either way, this lady is washing Jesus' let's just say his feet. In Luke 7, it's his feet. With her hair, it's this alabaster jar, and it's a year's wages. She comes in, she breaks the jar, throws it on her feet. Simon, she, he's at the Pharisee's house. He's like, if this guy knew what kind of woman this was, he'd never, ever let her do this. And Jesus is like, Simon, I have a question for you. And he's like, say it, teacher. So teacher says it. And he says, suppose you had two men. Suppose you had two people. And the master was owed debts by both. But one of them owed 500 denarii, or, or 500, or a lot of money here. And then the other one owed a small amount of money here. And the master saw that neither of them could repay. So he freely forgave them both. He said, which one would be more loved? And he says, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said, you've chosen the right one. And he said, this woman who is a sinner. Like she wasn't the only one there. Do you know that two people in that house left smelling the same that day? Jesus and the woman with the fragrance of what she wiped on his feet. But here's the catch to this thing. We think that because she was forgiven so much, she loved so much, not realizing that in the reality of the gospel, whether you've sinned a little or sinned a lot, you've sinned the same. Why? In the law, sorry about that. I hope it survives my kicking. Whatever that is right there, speaker. So in the gospel, in order for somebody to be right with God, to achieve righteousness, you had to be perfect. You had to walk out what God called the law. So the law is the 613 laws and 10 commandments to top that off. And if you wanted to be right with God, you had to, in your own strength, walk out each one and never miss one. So 613 laws and 10 commandments, you had to walk perfectly, never miss one, and then God said righteousness would be given to you. So righteousness in the Old Testament was right standing with God. So God made a covenant between man and himself and said, if you want right standing with you, it's it, with me, it's easy. All you have to do is walk out holiness because God's a holy God. So he gave holy laws and said, if you do this, you can have this. So man tried and tried and tried and couldn't do it. The whole Old Testament is about man trying to get to righteousness in his own strength and man falling short the whole time. And rebellion and idolatry and harlotry, just hard, hard, hard times. God said, this is what I require. The requirements were the law. So man couldn't do it. So when Jesus was born, he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was born as a man. She was impregnated by God, but Jesus didn't walk as God. And he came and humbled himself. Philippians 2 says he humbled himself, became a bondservant, and walked as a mere man. And other places in Scripture says that Jesus was tempted at all points, yet was without sin. And Scripture says that it is impossible for God, in James, impossible for God to be tempted, nor can God tempt. That Scripture validates that Jesus did what He did as a man. And He had to because God made covenant between Himself and with man. The only way that man would have it is He would walk out this thing in holiness, the law and the commandments, and never miss it. Because James 2.10 says that if you miss one law, and it's referring to another law, if you miss one law out of all 613 and 10, you've transgressed them all. So if you walked perfect for 600 of them and missed the 601, 
all of your life is a wash and you've transgressed all of them. It doesn't seem fair. It's not about fair, it's about faith. So Jesus comes into the world and for 30 years he walks out perfection. He walks it out. He is the perfect one. He is a man. He's tempted at all points, yet he never falls for it. He never bites the bait. And he walks out the law and the commandments. And at 30 years old, he comes down to the River Jordan. And at 30, you inherit everything that your father has in Jewish culture. So at 30 years old, he could say, God's my father. And that meant that everything that God has is his. So they freaked him, wanted to kill him when he said, God's his father. Because he made himself equal to God because at 30 you were equal to your father's inheritance in Jewish culture. So when Jesus says, my father, and they're like, oh, they want to kill him. God's his father. You're saying you're equal to God. He said it time and time again. And they want to kill him for it. But when Jesus comes down to the River Jordan, John the Baptist is down there baptizing people. And in Deuteronomy 6.25 it talks about it talks about the reality of receiving righteousness if you walk straight and never go to the left or to the right. But in Deuteronomy 28, it talks about the blessings of obedience. And one of those blessings is, I will open the heavens. Your enemy comes one way and flees from you seven different ways. You're the head and not the tail, above and, and not beneath. Blessed going, in, blessed going out. You're just blessed. Everything you put your hand to will be blessed. That's what the blessings of obedience. And that's if you were obedient and walked out the law. So Jesus was obedient and walked out the law. So when he came to John the Baptist, he said, John, I need you to baptize me. And John says, I need your baptism. And Jesus says, no, John, I need you to do this because it's necessary so that righteousness gets fulfilled. Well, what was the fulfillment of righteousness? Was the fulfillment of the law. So Jesus, as a man, walked out the whole law. And at 30 years of age, he comes down to the water John baptizes him, he goes into the water, and what happened to the heavens then? They opened legally and they never closed again. Because of what Jesus did. And the Holy Spirit comes down, bang, rests upon Jesus. God says, this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. So Jesus goes, he's tempted, comes back out, 40 days later, he starts his ministry. And it's like, crazy. Why? He's right with God. He is filled with the Spirit of God. Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Why? Was it God? Was it Jesus healing them? Or was it God in Jesus healing them? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So now it was God here, the Son here, and Holy Spirit here. Jesus, the one anointed with, the one smeared with God. And the Holy Spirit was healing people through Jesus all the times. Yeah, that's it. See you later. I get it now. Kids, okay. <laughs> I told him last service, I've been in places where thousands and thousands of people are in the service and all of a sudden hundreds and hundreds of people get up at the same time. I'm like... <laughs> so Jesus, Jesus attains righteousness and it's given to him. So Jesus... He walks out his ministry, he walks out his life for three years, and on the three, about three and a half years, three and a half years later, he goes up the hill to Golgotha. They led him up there, and it says that when he was nailed to the tree, the handwriting of requirements and everything that was against you was nailed to him on that tree. Everything against you. Everything. God didn't leave anything out. Everything. Everything you wish you never did. So Jesus, he says, it's finished. And what was finished was your ability to get to God through your works. You didn't have to do that anymore because Jesus did it. Now, God said to Jesus that in whom I'm well pleased, his son. So Jesus, he's pleased with. Why? Because he walked out everything. So righteousness was given to Jesus. But in order for God to extend, extend his hand to us in mercy, he had to satisfy justice. Because the law required justice. There was justice. That's why God is a God of wrath in the Old Testament. There was justice. People messed up. You sin, you die. You sin, you die. The wages of sin is death. But when you come to Jesus, Jesus paid the price to satisfy the wrath of God. And what judgment wasn't put upon Jesus on the tree? We're not in a day of judgment. We're in a day of mercy. So Jesus says, mercy 
God says mercy. And God says, you know what? It's not complicated, guys. Jesus said it's finished. He goes to hell, pays for the sin of mankind, comes up. God becomes our Father. He sends His blood on the mercy seat, sits in heaven. And all God's asking us to do is to believe that what Jesus did is enough. So instead of 613 and 10, we have two. That's crazy. So try it either way. You can try it the other way, or you can try two. Why is it so complicated? The simplicity of the gospel, 2 Corinthians 11.3, says, I fear lest as Satan deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted and taken away from the simplicity that is in the Christ. And in the original, it says the simplicity and the purity that's in the Christ. This thing is so simple that a child can get it. And God says, unless you become like a child. Are you guys following me? This is a long time, I know, but it's really good. So I came to God, and all my junk, and all my trash, and all my life, and all my regret, and all my stuff, and all my sin, and all my drug addiction, all my atheism, all my theft, all my lying, all my everything, all my manipulation, all my maneuvering, I believe that when Jesus hung on that tree, God says that He disarmed the principalities and made a public spectacle of them, made a laughing stock of the devil on that tree. And Satan thought he won. Because all he knows how to do is steal, kill, and destroy. And I believe that on that day when Jesus was crucified, he went down to hell. And that third day, I believe that Michael, angel, that the angels didn't have to get Jesus' his front or his back, that the Holy Ghost came down into darkness on that third day. Jesus is down there, comes down in. Jesus didn't say, Michael, get my front. Gabriel, get my back. I mean, the Holy Spirit didn't say that. I'm going to get the sun. Watch my back. He didn't say that. Light lit up darkness. <laughs> had to be awesome oh that's exciting to me because he did it for me that's amazing Jesus comes up out of there with the keys to hell death and the grave awesome and I believe that Satan called a huddle that day I do I believe he got all the demons together in a huddle he said, guys, 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 stop. Because everybody's going, no. Oh. He said, easy, we can do this. Come on, we can't defeat God. But we can defeat God in man. We can't defeat Jesus. He already beat us. We have a very short time period. But we can deceive people. We can get them self-centered, self-focused, selfish. We can get them seeking their own stuff. We can get them caring about themselves and nobody else. We can push everything around them. We can push their buttons. We can squeeze them. We can give them all kinds of trials. They'll never believe this. It's too easy. They'll complicate it. They'll read everything trying to figure it out and not believe the simple gospel. They'll try to do things to try to get to it. Man's been doing this forever. This is easy. We got this. You guys ready? Let's go deceive man. Break. I promise you. He's not up to anything new. Just as he deceived Eve through his craftiness, he's trying to corrupt the mind of man, taking you away from the simplicity that's in the Christ. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to take it away and make it hard, make it complicated, make it, oh man, there's way too much. There's no way God will forgive me. Yeah, but I did it again. There's no way God will forgive me. You're wrong. Mercy is amazing. The only thing this gospel really costs you is it costs you to give up your life that you were never created to live for yourself. He's asking you to give up something you were never created to be so you could finally become who you were created to be. That's what it'll cost you. That's it. It says to he who loves much, it's because he's been forgiven much. Here's the catch, guys. When I went and I said, this is not making sense, God, help me with this. He said, Todd, the reason why the body of Christ doesn't love is because she doesn't believe how much she's been forgiven. That makes sense to me, because people told me, Todd, the reason why you love is because of how twisted you are. Well, that was giving me 
like the impression that they wanted an excuse of why they couldn't love. That's just twisted. And the reason why they can't is because they don't believe the truth of how much they've been forgiven because they keep listening to the voice of the liar that is keeping accusing them of stuff they've been forgiven of. And instead of believing the truth, they believe the lie. It's the truth, man. How many times have we focused on things that we wish we never did? It's Satan's, like, number one thing. He wants you to be worthless. He wants you to think you're worthless. You're not worth anything. You're not worth it. It's his number one thing. Why? Because he wants you to think that you're like him. Satan's not worth it, dude. He's depressed. He's angry. He's bitter. He's cut off. He's severed. And he wants you to think like him. He wants you to be headed to heaven thinking like hell till you get there. He wants you to be condemned. He wants you to live under condemnation all the days of your life. I've been a Christian for eight and a half years, and I've never had one day of condemnation. 30 seconds in the beginning. And then forever I've lived as a son. You can't condemn this, man. You can't convict, you can't have shame on me. There's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no condemnation. Well, yeah, but this was after I was a Christian. Man, you make a mistake, don't dwell in it. Get up and thank God for who you're created to be. Don't sit there in that mud, man. Did you guys ever see the movie Secretariat? How many saw it? Was that a good movie or what? My daughter, I'm going to end with this and we're going to pray. I'm sorry I'm late again. People are like, I ain't bringing you back to my church, buddy. You preach a never-ending gospel. Just kidding. You have an amazing pastor, man. It's awesome. You got, okay? Am I all right? All right, come on. I got to catch a plane at 4 o'clock. I'm good. <laughs> we want to pray for the sick, so just hang on, okay? So my daughter, she loves horses. And I'm like, when that movie first came out, I'm like, I'm not a big movie guy, man. I mean, I watch them, but I'm just, I'm just careful about what I put in here. God gave me a short time period. I'm on the earth to leave a legacy. So I'm not going to put stuff in here that's going to mess with this. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't need, usually I don't watch movies if my little baby can't watch them. I just don't. I believe that the, this thing right here, that I have an eye gate and an ear gate, and I'm just careful about what I put in there. I have a short time period. I'm not going to entertain my stuff. It's not going to build me up in Jesus. I'm not a legalist. I'm just a lover. I love God. <laughs> Gosh. So I told Destiny, I said, I'll go. Let's go. So we get to this movie, and I'm, there's no seats. It's packed. It's like opening night. I'm sitting there. I'm like, Jesus, help me. You know, and I'm okay, because I, I do stuff with my kids. I mean, I'm not a father that's like, no, you're not. But I'm just careful about what my kids see and watch and entertain themselves with. I'm careful about the music we listen to. I listen to rap. I listen to rock. I listen to hardcore. I listen to Christian music. I listen to lyrics that, that edify and encourage. And they're going to grow me, man. There's a rapper out there by the name of Lecrae. You heard him? i shake you to the core, man. It's amazing. I'm probably going to end up doing something with him. They're amazing, man. There's a hardcore band called For Today that is like scary amazing, man. I'm friends with them. Dude, this is crazy. God's like hitting the music industry. These people are getting rocked by the gospel. It's awesome, man. Awesome. So we go to this movie, and I'm sitting in the front, and I'm like, Jesus. And all of a sudden, it starts out. The horses are coming around the track. It starts out with scripture. I go, oh. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I just love it. I'm, 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 and I'm vocal, man. I'm not like a quiet guy. You probably guessed. <laughs> um, they're running around the track. Did you make the horse and his this? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Jesus. My daughter's like, Dad. <laughs> ah, serious. They're coming around the track. They do it, you know. And the story, if you didn't see it, even if you did, it's, it's an amazing story. And I can relate the gospel to the whole thing. Only because, like, this lady, this Penny, she went, her father, had, her mother died, and then their father had this, she had to take over the farm, and she believed that this baby, horse, was going to be born. The mother, one of them had speed, one of them had endurance, but no horse has both, one or the other. And so she just believed in her heart that it was going to have both. And I believe in Christianity, we can run with speed and endurance. 
I just believe that because that's what Jesus told us we have. It's not about people have told me, hey, brother, you need to chill out because this is a marathon, not a sprint. That's not in your Bible. It sounds like wisdom, and people told me that, but I just don't believe it. It's a race, man, and it's grace that helps me run the race. I'm not going to burn out. I am burning up. I am not going to fizzle out. I am eight and a half years, and it's way worse than it was when I first got saved. It's not wearing off, man. That's not Jesus at all. That sounds like wisdom, and it's because we don't want people to go off track. I get that. But if you don't want them to get off track and you're trying to help them stay on track with this knuckle grip, it doesn't work. It's the Holy Spirit that enables a spirit and truth. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. She believes. Way to go, Penny. I'm in the theater. My daughter's like, Dad, you're crazy. I'm like, I know. I'm crying, man. I'm like, oh God. The horse is born and the horse stands up faster than any other colt they've ever seen stand up. I'm like, yeah. Sight, man. I'm psyched. Really, this never goes away. This is awesome. I believe the Holy Spirit's like this. When you wake up in the morning, I believe the Holy Spirit's like, come on. Let's do it. I believe when you go shopping, He's like, can I come? I do. I believe there are angels that have been standing around for a long time waiting for you to say, okay, I'm ready now. It's the truth. God is for you. He's not against you. He wants you to run this race. He wants you to crush hell for a living. He gets a great privilege out of watching his kids stand in the midst of fire and destroy hell for a living. He loves watching his kids be on the job. Everybody come against them and his kids be like, I worship you, Jesus. He loves it. People coming and getting in your face, so I don't believe. Well. Well, if you don't believe me through the things that I say, at least believe me through the, what I do, because it's my Father in me that does the works. Bang. He loves that. He's excited about this. He's not bummed out. He is totally stoked. It's okay. It's awesome. So I'm watching this movie, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So he runs, and he's racing, and he's winning, and I'm like, oh, way to go, Penny. Awesome. Husband's like, you know what? I can't believe this. The kids are like, Mom. They're like, oh, you're crazy, I think. And my kids, my, my daughter, she's seen her dad go through so much. And for the first eight and a half months of my Christian life, when I got saved, when, when we got married, it was awesome. And then I started praying for people. And my wife told me in two weeks, she said, I will never go in public with you again. And for eight and a half months, she wouldn't even go out of the house with me. And that's a true story. And she hammered me, man. She would persecute me and all of her family because they thought she made a mistake when we got married. Now we're two weeks in and I'm praying for people and she won't go in public. So she's calling her mom to like vent. And her mom's like, I told you that you shouldn't have married him. What are you doing? You threw your whole life down the toilet. Now look. Now he's crazy. But I was a drug addict and a thief and a liar and all that. Now I'm just crazy because I believe the Bible that they don't believe. Which is, come on. So I see her life and I can see my life. And I'm looking at my daughter, I'm like, wow, God, this is awesome. He's emotional. No, I'm possessed. I am possessed by Jesus. I burn with a holy flame of fire, and I will not be put out by anybody. Even if you killed me, my blood would cry out. This doesn't just wear off. It's not a, wow, today you're really happy. Wrong. I'm going through major fire right now as I speak, but you wouldn't know it because I don't wear that, because I wear Christ, not as a mask, as a bodysuit. I put on Christ every day. And this is your privilege, your opportunity to represent the gospel and destroy hell. Man, you get to make the devil reminded of his big mistake every day if you just get over the it's not all about you thing. It's about him. When you're about him, he's all about you. Because he's for you, not against you. And if somebody's against you, who cares? Because God's for you. 
So I'm watching this, and then he races, and then he, he loses the one race, and then he races another one. And the jockey that's on Secretariat, the last horse that he raced, he ran him so hard that his heart burst. The horses don't know when to stop, so they just run so hard, his heart burst, and he died on the track. So I'm like, man, oh, my heart never burst. So he's running, and then they race the first race of the three, the triple crown, is that what it's called? He races the first one, and he wins. And he's racing, and, and I love Penny's demeanor, man, because the other guy, the other jockey, he, the owner, he's just arrogant and all that. And Penny's like, she holds her tongue, man. She's pretty good. And, and it's just good because that's what Christianity is about. It's not about popping off. I just, uh, man, I can just see it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's awesome. So he races the second race, and I'm like, ah, he takes wins. And I'm like, this is awesome. So he's like, we got a choice to make. You can rest him or you can run him. And he says, I say we run him. But we could make a mistake here because we could kill him. He could die out there because of the heart thing, all that stuff. She's like, I think he wants to run. And I'm like, let him run! <laughs> Dude, I'm serious. Run. It's true. It's how I think. It's awesome. It's passion, man. The gospel wasn't supposed to be known by its, just its good doctrine. It's supposed to be known by its passion. Yeah, people want something. They want something worth dying for, man. I, I found something worth dying for. That's you. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you have something worth dying for? Is it just your family? Has your family become more important to you than God? Because without God, you won't have a family. And without God, your family be lost, man. So they run him, and the other owner's like, tomorrow, kill him on the track. So the other day, the next day, I love it. They start out, and secretary, it's always like back. You know, the last shall be first, you know, kind of. He's always the last one. Well, in this one, he starts out, jets out of the gate, and he's like first, he's front runner. And then everybody's like, oh, no. Oh, my gosh, no. Oh, what is he doing? The reporters are freaking out. Penny's like, what's he doing? The owner's like, I don't know. This isn't good. Right? And the one guy that, you remember the personal, the trainer guy, the, what's his name? Ronnie. I forget his name. Not Ronnie was the jockey. Anyway, he's like, he's like, yeah. In the morning before the race, he's like, no, you about to see something you ain't never seen. And I'm like, faith. <laughs> yeah, red. That's what he called the horse, red. It's awesome. Gosh. They sing that song, Oh, Happy Day. Oh, come on, guys. Awesome. Get into the movie with me real quick. We would, but it's lunchtime. So he, so they start out and they're neck and neck. And Ronnie's on this horse and he's like, let's go. <laughs> Hits that horse. And I'm in the theater freaking out, dude. Because they hit the last corner and all of a sudden, Secretariat, they're running fastest pace any horse has ever run. And Secretariat's like, boom, see ya. And the other owner's like, what? Secretariat's like, boom. And it's like, oh, happy day. And he's like, 31 lengths ahead, man. This horse. And I'm like, ah! In the front, my daughter's like, Dad. People were like, oh, dear. Probably ruined the movie for people. It doesn't matter. Because it's Jesus, man. Because God has called us all to run hard. And he's called us all to finish the race. And he's called us to finish well. And Jesus wants us to just dare to run and not grow weary, but to run with Jesus, man. I'm calling you up, church, to what God has called you to. He's called you to finish gloriously. He's called you to run hard. He's called you to not grow weary. He's called you to understand the grace and mercy and power of God. 
He's called you to be filled with the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. He has called you to destroy hell for a living. He has called you out, guys. If you would say you're a Christian, I would ask you, would you dare to run with me? Would you run with me? Would you sit there? Would you run with me? Or would you sit back and say, well, you know, that's not me. You're wrong. Would the real you please step forward? The Bible is clear. It's true. It's powerful. Jesus wants us to have something worth dying for. He wants us to live our life in such a way that people around us are freaked out by our very existence. Well, we're not dominated or controlled by our surroundings, but we are the source of hope, an ambassador of hope for the world to grab a hold of so that they become like you as you become like Him. Gosh. Awesome. Okay, I stopped burning now. Ah, now we can pray. Sorry. It's awesome, man. Good news. You do me a favor. You love on somebody before you go out of here today. I love you with all my heart. Your feet good, man? Ha, 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 ha. It'll keep going, man. Come on. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for complete wholeness. God, I thank you that even throughout the day, healing and wholeness happens for everyone here. God, I thank you in Jesus, Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Pastor.